I am a big finished work of Jesus person. Amen. Like I love to be able to study and to see what all Jesus accomplished for me and for you through his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. Amen. And, and at each stage, Jesus was doing amazing things to begin to pull down the kingdom of darkness. But how many know we need to see that finished, completed work in its fullness? And I think sometimes we stop too early. We talk a lot about what he did for us at the cross. We'll talk about the resurrection around Easter time. But we rarely ever mention what he does in the ascension. And how many know that, that Jesus talked to his disciples and told them about this amazing event that was going to happen within their lifetime where the temple of Jerusalem would be destroyed? How many know that event is not insignificant, but it is also fulfilling all kinds of Old Testament prophecies? And so we really can't stop looking at the finished work of Jesus until we get all the way to the last prophecy of Jesus finding fulfillment. And so that's what we're going to do today. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's go ahead and we'll jump in it. We looked at the kingdom of darkness and how many know that at the time that Jesus was walking the shores of Galilee, uh, uh, Satan had begun to tempt him and he showed him all the kingdoms of the entire world. You remember that? And he said, all these kingdoms are now mine. And, and the way he began to rule was through the law of sin and death. He got Adam to sin. Sin produced spiritual death. Spiritual death produced fear because now Adam had been separated from God, who is his source of everything. Adam had no cares in the world. He had no fear. He had no anxiety. He had no low self-worth. He had no low self-image until he sinned. And when he was then separated from God, that is what produced fear. He sows little fig leaves. He tries to cover himself. He has inferiority and insecurities. He has worries. He has fear now. And then Satan uses the fear fears that we have because God's not now our source. We're having to figure it out in our own limited ability to begin to drive us back into sin to further separate us from God so that we have more fear, more anxiety, more depression. And it's just a vicious cycle that Jesus came to end. And so we know that on the cross, praise the Lord, Jesus conquers sin. Praise the Lord. So, and Jesus then uh, 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 goes ahead and uh, through his resurrection, Jesus conquers death. And then we know that the perfect love of God, it casts out all fear. So through the cross and through the resurrection and through the love and embrace of God, the entire kingdom of darkness collapses. Amen? I know they went to the slide just a little bit too early. All right. So Jesus is then descends into Shoal, is what the Old Testament would teach it, the, and he preaches to the imprisoned spirits there. So at his crucifixion, he dies, and his spirit goes down into the place of the dead. And Peter tells us that he is preaching to those that were imprisoned imprisoned in Shoal. He didn't go into hell to suffer more. He had already done that on the cross and he conquered Satan and defeated Satan's power on the cross. And the reason he was able to do that is because Satan's power had to do with sin where he could accuse you before God and could accuse God before you. You know what I'm saying? So sin caused the accuser of the brethren to be able to to begin to launch accusations. And in the separation, we had a bunch of issues and problems. Well, how many know when the sin is forgiven, all the accusations flee? That's why in Christ Jesus, we can find peace from all of that. The guilt, the shame, the condemnation of these things, we can have peace through Jesus because he cleanses us and, and washes us as white as snow and casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. And God God remembers it no more. Amen. 
But then Jesus doesn't stop there. He ascends into heaven after giving those that were in Shoal a message. And last week we looked at what that message looked like because we can find it in the book of Revelation where he tells them, uh, they say, how much longer must we wait? And, And Jesus says, just a little bit more. There's a little bit more that has to be accomplished before the end of the Old Covenant. And at the end of the Old Covenant, I'm coming to get you. And and, and Abraham's bosom comes out of this place. And because of it, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. How many glad Jesus did that for us? Amen? Well, afterwards, Jesus ascends into heaven and applies his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Remember, Jesus is there and he says, hey, uh, you can't touch me right now. I have not yet ascended. Remember him saying that? Yeah, because he had to go do his high priestly work. Then after he ascends and applies his blood on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies in heaven, stepping outside of time to secure eternal redemption, then that is when, of course, Jesus then comes back and starts to talk to his disciples. But now that he's done his high priestly duty in heaven, secured eternal redemption, he says, hey, touch me. See my side? Put your fingers in here. See my hands? Go ahead. Yeah, stop being unbelieving and start believing everybody. Amen. And and so, yeah, so, so Jesus begins to talk to his disciples, and then he goes up in a cloud, and the angels see uh, are, are, are there, and, and, and it's right at the time that he says, now go into all this world because all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Amen? The kingdom of God that cannot be shaken has begun. And so while Jesus is in, is in heaven, we found out last week that he cast Satan out of heaven. There's no reason for the accuser to be able to be there because there's no sin to accuse us of. And that's where I want to pick off today, amen, is in that great battle in heaven where, where, where Satan is thrown down to the earth, amen. So go ahead and flip the slide here. Jesus told his disciples that some of them were going to live to see, number one, God's kingdom come in power, amen. There would be a transference from Old Testament to new. The Old Testament would end and the New Testament would be seen in the sky, They would see the armies of of heaven in the sky. They would see the king and his kingdom, okay? And then number two, they would witness the destruction of Jerusalem, all right? So they were going to see something, and then they were going to witness something. And it's from the, the changing from the old covenant to the new. The old covenant would end, the new covenant would begin, and that's exactly what Hebrews tells us. Hebrews says that, the, that, that Jesus started a new covenant, and how many know he did that when he was broke bread with his disciples? Communion, right, was, was him starting. This blood is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. So he starts it, and he says, now that it's begun, the old covenant is, is vanishing away. It will soon end. This is the event that was going to end the old and ratify the new. Amen? And so, praise the Lord, let's take a look at it. Uh, So in Luke chapter 9, verse 27, Jesus tells his disciples, guys, there's some of you who stand here who will in no way taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some of his disciples are going to witness this event. How many can say yes? It's pretty clear, right? Some of you standing here, so I ain't talking about us, <laughs> talking about those that were standing there in front of Jesus, which was the 12 disciples. And he says, some of you guys are going to live and you are not going to die until you see the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to tell him in Mark 14, he says, you will see, so talking to his disciples again, the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God or the right hand of power, and you're going to see him coming with the clouds of the sky. Who's going to see that? The disciples are going to see this. Amen. You say, Pastor, you're messing with my eschatology. I'm not trying to mess with your eschatology. I'm trying to show you the finished work of Jesus in its totality. 
And if your eschatology needs to adjust to the finished work of Jesus, we're going to have to figure that out later. But all I know is we can't start with saying, oh, my, uh, uh, no, no. It's very clear Jesus is not talking to us. He is talking to his 12 disciples. And we better realize that because we're about to see something that's going to change everything. Does this make sense? So, so, so today, we ain't messing with eschatology. We're just looking at the Bible to see what it actually says so that we can fully see the finished work of Jesus so you know what Jesus has fully done on your behalf. Amen. So praise the Lord. I'll give you a few more. Praise the Lord. Just in case you're not yet convinced. Mark chapter 13, verse 30 says, This generation. What generation, everybody? The present generation. Some of you standing here are going to see it. This generation that's alive right now will not pass away until, same exact verbiage he uses with his disciples, isn't it? Until they see all these things happen. Matthew 10, verse 23, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. He's talking to his 12 disciples. You are not even going to be able to go through all of the cities of Israel before this event happens. Wow. Amen. Do you need any more? I'll give you another one. So Jesus is telling, his, he's telling the Pharisees, he says, uh, uh, you, you guys, um, uh, you say that you are the offspring or the descendants of those that have murdered the prophets. And he says, so fill up then the measure of the guilt of your father's sin because they're going to go on to murder the apostles. And he says, I tell you, all of this will come upon this generation talking about the punishment for murdering the apostles, that it will happen to those that murdered the apostles. Are you hearing me? All right, so with that established, let's go ahead and let's just look, look, look at a few things here. So Jesus was marking an event that would complete the Old Testament. It's going to complete Old Testament prophecy. And Jesus even tells his disciples, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, he tells them in, in, in Luke, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, that all of the prophecies of the Old Testament are going to be complete. This will mark the completion of the Old Covenant, and it launches the New Covenant. But you can't start a New Covenant until the Old One's fulfilled. Amen? So this event becomes the total fulfillment of all, all prophecy. And how many know Deuteronomy 28, which is the curses of the law, all that fall right onto Israel between 66 to 70 AD. Everything that is said in that curse of the law down, I mean, it is like a check mark. You just can take it through and just see, study history and just check it off the list. Everything mentioned checks off the list in these three and a half years that's about to come. All Old Testament prophecy is finding its fulfillment at this event so that the New Testament now is launched. Amen. And so the cross, it defeated Satan, but at Jesus' appearance, the Bible tells us, that's when Satan's going to be judged. Amen. He, he was stripped of power at the cross, but he wasn't judged at the cross. His judgment was about to come. And do you remember when, when Jesus was casting demons out of, of the one that had the legion? Do you remember what the legion said? Have you come to torment us or judge us before God's appointed time? They understood that God had an appointed time of judgment and that the appointed time was near, but the appointed time was not yet. Wow. Wow. When's the appointed time for judgment? When Jesus appears in the clouds, that is the appointed time for their judgment. Amen. So you say, well, Jesus didn't appear in the clouds, though. Are you so sure? Let me show you a few historians, two of them, eyewitness historians. They were literally there on the day it happened and recorded it in history. You can go online and you can find everything I'm about to show you for yourself. It is all available for free online. Amen. All right. So first one is this. Actually, before we get there, Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Uh, this is written between 56 to 65 A.D., 
And, and the Apostle Paul, the same guy, by the way, that says uh, that Satan is the god of this world, Satan was the god of this world, he showed, he showed Jesus all the nations that he was ruling, he was the god of this world. But how many know for this purpose the Son of God was manifest to destroy the work of the devil? He was not going to maintain that position that he stole from the first Adam. The second Adam was coming for the purpose of removing it from him and handing it back to his people. Today, Satan is not the God of this world. That was true in the day that verse was written. <laughs> but look at what Paul says. He says, in just a short time, he didn't say 2,000 years late. No, no, no. In just a short time, the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. He's coming back in the clouds. And when he does, Satan's kingdom will be crushed and Satan will be judged. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, this is Josephus. He was a Jewish, not a Christian Jewish. He was a Jewish historian and eyewitness of these events. And then in the book that he records, Wars, he records this. Now, listen to this. He says, a certain prestigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. He doesn't even actually describe it other than to say, I suppose that the account of it would seem to be a fable. It would seem like it's not even true. And he goes on to say, For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds. Now, what did Jesus say his disciples would see? The kingdom of God in the clouds. What does Josephus say happens in 66 A.D.? By the way, this happens at 66 A.D. during the feast of Passover. So in 30 A.D., Jesus dies during the feast of Passover. 66 A.D., Jesus returns at the feast of Passover, and they see chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor running about amongst the clouds. Heavenly armies surrounding Jerusalem. And they felt a quaking, and they heard a great noise. There was an earthquake and a great noise. Matter of fact, Matthew talks about that, that, that after Jesus had been risen from the dead, sometime after that event, there was a quaking, <laughs> and, and, and then people came up out of the grave. Remember that? And they walked around the city for several days, and then they were taken up. They were no more. This is the most overlooked resurrection in the entire Bible. <laughs> but it's this resurrection is the reason that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If it weren't for this resurrection, you and I would still go into Abraham's bosom, awaiting a day that Jesus would come and rescue us and resurrect us. But our resurrecting king is resurrecting. Are you listening to me? Amen. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is the event that marks all of this. They hear this quaking, this great noise. After that, they hear a sound of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. Let us get up out of here. A great multitude saying, let us remove from this place. Pretty interesting. Let's go ahead and see what some other people have to say about it. Praise the Lord. So this is the Sefer. So the first one, by the way, was written in the first century. He was an eyewitness written in the first century. This is, I think, the third or fourth century. But they're studying and they're seeing what exactly this phenomenon was. And this is what they found out. Moreover, there was discerned on or seen over the Sanctum Sanctorium, which is just the Holy of Holies. A whole night long, there was the face of of a man, wonderful, Jesus in his glory, and yet terrible, because they realized that he was coming for judgment. There appeared also at the same time chariots with horsemen, and there were great blasts in the sky coming toward Jerusalem. 
Let me give you another piece of, I, uh, of historical information. Amen? Let me give you another one. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that one. <laughs> I'll let you figure that one out. Once again, this is 3rd to 4th century. It says, after many days, a certain figure appeared in, of tremendous size. Now, we know what that figure was, don't we? What was the big, huge figure that appeared of tremendous size? It was the face of Jesus in the clouds. Now, this is not when Jesus physically descends. That ends the church age. This is his appearance in the sky. This is what starts the New Testament age and ends the Old Testament age. Are you hearing me? Which many people saw, just as the books of the Jews have disclosed. And before the setting of the sun, there was suddenly seen in the clouds chariots and armed battle arrays by which the cities of all of Judea and its territories were invaded. A heavenly army invading. Come on, Jesus coming back with his, in his glory with Heaven's army. And then there was a sound given forth afterwards, even to those who heard shouted in a sudden voice, We cross over from here. <laughs> Who's crossing over from here? Abraham's bosom. God is leaving the temple. His presence is leaving the temple. And Jesus has returned for the purpose of taking all those Old Testament saints to heaven with him now that the Old Testament has closed. Amen. All right, let me give you another one. <laughs> This is like highly recorded in, in, in history. Here's, here's another eyewitness historian. This one's not a Christian, not a Jew. He's a Roman historian that was there to witness the event. And this is what he writes about it. There had been seen hosts joining battle in the skies. Hosts of angels are in the skies. Fiery gleams of arms. Then the temple it, it, it became illuminated by this sudden radiance from the clouds. He's looking outside. He doesn't see the face of Jesus that the Jews are seeing inside. He's just seeing the radiance and the glory of some figure that's above the temple. Then the doors of the inner shrine of the temple, the inner court, they suddenly were thrown open and and voice of more than mortal tone was heard. The voice of God and crying out that the gods were departing. <laughs> He's a Roman. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Abraham's bosom. You know what I'm saying? At the same instant, there was a mighty stir as of departure. The Romans watched. Something happened where they saw the presence of God leave the temple and a host of others leaving the temple with him. Wow. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Amen. Now, I know your mind might be tweaking right now. Amen. So, uh, 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 what's going on? Praise the Lord. How many know we ain't looking at all that just yet? Let's just look at the finished work of Jesus. Amen? Now, here's what's so beautiful about it. We don't have to twist Jesus' words to any of his disciples. It fits perfectly with what he told them. Some of you standing here are going to see this. That's what he said. It's amazing how the church tries to twist the words of Jesus to mean something totally different than what is plainly declared. Are you hearing me? And we don't have to twist any of the words of Jesus because everything Jesus said happened or would happen happened exactly as he said that it would. Amen? And so, and so this is something for us to be able to study and understand so that we can fully appreciate everything Jesus did through his death, burial, resurrection and appearing in the clouds above Jerusalem. Amen. So let's take a look at it real quick. All right. 
This prophecy, this prophesied event is what ended the old covenant. We established that, amen? And so let's go ahead. John tells it this way. Uh, of course, you know the story of Lazarus and uh, Mary and Martha. And they said, your brother Lazarus will rise again, all right? So this is Jesus. And he says, your brother is going to rise again. Jesus tells her. And then Martha replies, and Martha says something that is, that, that is amazingly accurate. Matter of fact, Jesus says this on several occasions, the same thing that Martha is about to say through the Gospels. She says, I know, I know that he will rise, and he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the, say with me, the last day. And then Jesus tells her something that we need to take note of. He says, Martha, I am the resurrection. The last day was talking about me. See, when the church reads the last day, we think the last day of human history. <laughs> but how many know if that's the case, then Abraham's bosom has not yet been emptied, which means to be absent from the body is not to be present with the Lord. So that can't be what she's referencing. And Jesus tells her that's not what is being referenced. It's not the last day on of human history that's being referenced because I am the resurrection that you're looking for. My resurrection will create another resurrection that will empty Abraham's bosom. And because of that resurrection, that's why the church can proudly declare that when we uh, are absent from this place, we are with God in heaven, we are not anyplace else, we're with him. Amen. So notice when he says this resurrection happens, though, it happens on the last day. The last day of what? If it's not the last day of human history, then it must be the last day of the old covenant. I know all the old covenant saints are going to come out of their graves. It's been prophesied all throughout the Old Testament that there's one that's going to come. Ezekiel prophesies about it, that, that all of a sudden these bones start coming together and they're being prophesied too, and then skin starts growing up over top of them, right? They, 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 they had it. They understood when, when the Messiah comes, he is going to change everything. And those that died in faith are going to come up out of their graves. Amen. And so he says this resurrection, this resurrection happens on the last day of the old covenant. Well, what would the last day of the old covenant be? The last day Jesus' presence is in the temple. Because what creates the old covenant? God. <laughs> so when God leaves the temple, that is the last day that the old covenant is intact. The second God leaves, there is no more covenant. God left the building. And on the day God leaves the building, I know He's going to rise the day God leaves. Amen. So Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Let's go ahead and see how, how Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians. He said, Christ is risen from the dead and has become, notice this, the first fruit. Amen. Now, here's something interesting is, is you guys have an understanding because we started to do a Christianized version of Passover the last two years. So, so on Passover, Jesus was the Passover lame that was slain. The first Sunday, which we call Easter Sunday, or the world calls Easter Sunday, is actually the first fruit. It's the day Jesus rises. Jesus was the first fruit unto God. No one comes out of the grave with Jesus. It's not the harvest yet. The harvest happens on Pentecost. Now, they see Jesus in the sky. They see him at Passover. But you know when they hear the voices saying, let us remove ourselves from this place? During the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days later. The Feast of Pentecost was the Feast of the Harvest. Jesus was the first to come out of the grave. Amen. He was the first of those falling asleep so that in all things he would have the preeminence. 
He was the firstborn from the spiritually dead. No one else but Jesus has that place of honor and privilege. That's why, that's why Mark doesn't record this event. Luke does not record this event. Why? If it happened at the time Jesus had risen, surely both gospel writers would have included it in their gospel. That's a big event to not include. Problem is both those gospel writers wrote their gospel before 66 AD. And Matthew was written after 66 AD. Which is the reason why Matthew is the only gospel that includes this event of people coming out of their graves and being seen by many. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. So Jesus becomes the first fruit. But since for, for, for since by man came death, by man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all will die. So in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Here goes the order. He's going to give it to you. Number one, Jesus is coming up out of that grave. Christ, the first fruits. He was the firstborn of the spiritually dead, that in all things he would have the preeminence. And then afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming. Wow. What do you mean at his coming? At the appearance of of him, the thing he'd been telling everybody about. Soon Satan's gonna get crushed underneath your feet. You guys are gonna, you won't even be able to go through the cities of Israel and Jerusalem and, uh, 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 and, and Judea until you see me come back to empty the bosom of Abraham. I'm gonna clear it all out, everybody. I'm gonna judge Satan. I'm gonna do the final prophecies of the old covenant. They're all going to be fulfilled just as the prophets declared. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, in 66 AD, Jesus emptied Abraham's bosom. Wow. That changes your and I destiny for good, like forever for good. That's why there is no fear in death. If, come on, because our death is our resurrection. Are you listening to me? We don't go to the place of the dead. We don't have no holding spot for us. We don't go to no Abraham's bosom. We don't have, no, we don't, we don't descend at all. At the moment of death, God wraps us with a new body, a heavenly one, and we ascend into the very presence of the Father. That's why Paul said, I'm torn between the two. I've got a desire to stay because I know I need to be doing some stuff for, for the kingdom of God, but I'd really like to just shed this tent and put on this new body, this new glorified thing God's got, and just go and be in his presence forever. Amen? Here's the second thing. Praise the Lord. In 70 AD, Jesus judges Satan. And you say, well, what's he doing in between those times? Number one, he rescues the church. Number two, uh, he rescues the bosom of Abraham. Number two, those that are in the church, he sends away out of Israel and he protects them. And we'll look at that in just a moment. And, and, and while they're being protected outside of Jerusalem, God now fulfills the promise that he gave to Israel. He told them on several occasions that if you keep worshiping this God you worship, your father, the devil, there will be a day that comes that I will release you into the hands of the God you want to serve. The next three and a half years, they are released into the hands of the God that they had chosen to serve. God's judgment is him stepping back and releasing them and allowing them to see how wonderful their gods really were in comparison to the goodness of the Father. And Revelation says that, that, that Apollyon was released. He had been bound before, now it gets released again. Why? Because it was one of the gods, one of the demon spirits Israel had chosen to worship. And here hell is released on them because that is who they chose to worship. And the outcome of it is nothing but destruction because Satan don't care how well you serve him. 
He hates you. It doesn't matter how good you do for him. He, it doesn't matter if you crucify Jesus. It doesn't matter if you kill all, off the apostles. It, it, it doesn't matter what you do for him. When he hates you, he wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. That's why I don't understand anybody that wants any part of his kingdom. I don't want it. Amen? And so after he wreaks havoc all across Israel and it ends in total destruction, I mean, the entire city is burnt. I mean, they cut off food supplies. I mean, there's records of them eating their own children. I mean, it gets bad, bad. Matter of fact, Jesus said there, there, there will never be a day as worse as what they experienced because all of hell got released upon them. And, and, and hell ain't good. Like, uh, like <laughs> the kingdom of darkness is not good. The kingdom of darkness is always trying to destroy you. And the only reason why the kingdom of darkness, praise the Lord, has not had the ability that it has had is because God is intervening. So just imagine, the, just imagine, for the first time in Israel's history, God steps back and does nothing. And not one stone of the temple was left upon another, and the entire city was burned to the ground. And that's what Satan wants to do in your life. That's what the kingdom of darkness wants to do in our lives. Burn it to the ground. So, Jesus comes in to begin to judge Satan for what he's done. And in John chapter uh, 12, Jesus tells the disciples that, that, that time for this is already now. He says, the time for judging this world, it has come. It's here. Amen. Well, how many know if the time for judging the world has come when Jesus was standing on the shores of Galilee... He wasn't talking about 2,000 plus years later because the time had already come. When Satan, now notice the judgment of the world. The judgment of the world is not that the whole entire planet gets destroyed. The judgment of the world is that the kingdom of darkness gets destroyed. The God of this world gets destroyed. The judgment was on the one that was leading everyone into what they were doing. So here's the judgment of the world. Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out of this world. Now, last week we saw that, that, that after, after uh, uh, Jesus took the sin on the cross, praise the Lord, there was a, a, a war in heaven and Michael the archangel won the battle and Satan was cast out out of heaven, down to the earth. But then it says that once he hits the earth, he's really, really mad because he knows his season is very, very short. Come on, that ha Wait, of course it's short. He only, he only has, what, uh, 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 36 more years? 40 more years? And then judgment falls on him where now he's not cast just out of heaven. Now he's going to get cast out of the earth too. And we'll see it in just a moment. And so when I am lifted up, now does that signify the type of death Jesus was going to die? Absolutely. Is it only talking about his death though? No, it's not. Because, because lifting up is also the ascension of Jesus. So yeah, when I go to the cross and through my death, burial, resurrection, and then my ascension and I am lifted up from the earth, I'm going to begin the process of drawing everyone to myself. There are billions of Christians on the planet at this point, and God is still reaching out and calling out and drawing all men to himself. And he's going to continue that process until, until, until New Testament Bible prophecy is fulfilled. Amen? Until every nation has been, has been made into a disciple of Jesus. Isn't that the mission of the church? To go into all the nations and make disciples of every nation. Not, not just every people group. No, no, no. Make disciples of the nations. 
The whole purpose is that the kingdom of darkness that once had control of every nation no longer has control of any nation. And there is a time coming, praise the Lord, and it may take 2,000 more years. I don't know. But there is a time coming that every nation will not be underneath the dominion of any part of the realm of darkness. Every nation will have seen the light and every nation will come underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. You say, David, I, it doesn't even look possible. That's kind of God's, kind of what he does. I mean... With God, all things are possible. We say it, do we believe it though? Yes, all things are possible with God. We have more faith in Satan's kingdom than God's kingdom. Which one's more powerful? The greater one's in us. Amen. So let's go ahead and take a look here at Revelation chapter 12. Praise the Lord. You who live in the heavens rejoice. Why? Because Satan just got cast out of heaven. It says, but terror will now come on the earth. And when did Satan get cast out of heaven? Come on now. About 30, 33 AD, right? And now that he's cast out, he's come down to you in great anger. And, and here's why he's so mad. Because he knows he has 2,000 years left. No, no. He's so mad because he knows that he has a little tiny bit of time left. Isn't that what Paul said? In just a short time, the God of peace will come and crush Satan under our feet, church. All right? So he knows he's got just a little tiny bit of time left. So when the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth right about 30 A.D., he pursues the woman that gave birth to the male child. He pursues the, the nation that gave birth to Jesus, or you could say the Jewish church. Because it was the remnant of Israel. Amen? It's the remnant of Israel. And, and so the remnant of Israel became followers of the Messiah of Israel. And so Satan comes down and he begins to try to destroy the remnant of Israel, the followers of the Messiah. And it goes on to say this about it. He says, but she was given two wings like those of a great eagle so that she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. And guys, how many of you know that, that the apostles all began to leave Jerusalem? They got out of Jerusalem and went into other places. And then there, outside of Jerusalem, she would be cared for and protected. Why? Because this stuff's coming on Jerusalem. So God gets the church out of Jerusalem so, and, and protects the church. So she could be cared for and protected from the dragon for time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years, which just so happens to be the exact time of the length of Rome's siege on Jerusalem from 60 A.D. to 70 A.D. Wow. So, let's take a, 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 a look a little bit further. It says, so, this is Ebius, or I guess that's how you say it. I don't know. Once again, these people's names back in the day, hallelujah, it is, I don't know. I, I might have to name, if I have another son, I have to name him Ebius, or Esipus, or Eusebius. All right, one of these. Before the war began, Members of Jerusalem, of, of, of the church of Jerusalem, they were ordered by an angel given by revelation of those worthy of it to leave the city of Jerusalem and to go and settle in a place called Pella. And here they migrated there to Pella from Jerusalem to be protected for three and a half years. Wow. Wow as if once holy men had deserted the royal capital of the Jews and the whole land of Judea, then the judgment of God might finally fall on them for the crimes against Christ and his apostles. History records this all happening. I just think that's pretty amazing. And so, praise the Lord. So what's the Bible say about it when this happens? Well, Revelation chapter 20 says, So then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the keys to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. Remember what Jesus said. 
when I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw people to myself. But he also says, because now's the judgment of the world where the prince of the power of the world will be cast out of the earth. <laughs> this is the casting out of the earth, everybody. So an angel comes down, keys of heaven to the bottomless pit, heavy chain in his hand, and he seizes the dragon, the old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and he bounds him in chains for a thousand years. Somebody said, well, uh, it's just 1,000 years. Uh, nobody, nobody in, the, nobody in the first century thought that this meant a literal 1,000 years. I'm, nobody. That, that went until the 1800s that we started talking like that. Everybody realized that the Bible uses this as a representation of a, for instance, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and all the gold and silver are his. Oh, so how about the thousand and first hill? God doesn't own those cattle? Come on, there, there is literally a place on the, on, on the earth that has a thousand hills just in one location. No, it, it, the thousand is representation of all. God owns all. The earth and the fullness thereof, he owns all of it. The earth and the fullness thereof, he owns the cattle on every single hill. A thousand is just a representation of all. I'm a covenant keeping God, keeping my covenant down to a thousand generations. So you stop keeping your covenant at the thousand and first one? No! He's saying, I'll never stop keeping my covenant. Are you listening to me? People are like, Jesus is going to rule for a thousand years. Have you ever read your Old Testament? I, I, I guess not, praise the Lord. How about the New Testament? Because, come on, to us a child is born and a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and the increase of his peace, it's just going to keep increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing and growing and growing and growing and growing until it's finally fulfilled. Of this increase, there will be a thousand years. Come on, what's it say? No end! Because the Messiah's kingdom never ends. The Messiah's kingdom is forever. It's forever. The only thing that ends isn't the reign of the Messiah. The only thing that ends is the goal of the church so the new Jerusalem is able to descend. And we can be with Jesus forever and ever. Once we complete our mission. We're going to talk about that next week, what that actually looks like and what all this type of stuff is. Where do we go from here? I'm going to show you that next week, okay? But I just need you to know this, that there is a mission, a kingdom assignment, a task that God has for you to complete. And if you complete that task, the increase of his government will be, it will bring an increase of peace. The reason why America is decreasing into morality is because, uh, or, 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 or depravity, is, is because the church has not been on its mission in America. In other places, that's not happening. Instead, places are coming out of stuff that's going on. And they're following Jesus. How many know the more that we get Christ in the human hearts and the more we're making disciples of people, the more people start to choose righteousness over lawlessness. Love over hate. And the better the world becomes. And his government and kingdom will not be shaken. And the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So if we lose our minds, he'll just go and start working in other areas of the world until we figure it out and get back on mission again. And then he'll be like, all right, I'm ready to work with you again. If I can't increase here, I'll increase over here. But my increase is never going to stop. <laughs> So he, he, he seizes the dragon, the old serpent, bound him in chains for the church age. And so it goes on to tell us this, praise the Lord, the angel threw him into the bottomless pit. So now he's not just bound, he's thrown into Tartarus, which he then shut and locked. 
So he's bound, thrown into hell, shut, locked it, so he could never get out while the church age exists. So that he could not deceive the nations anymore till the church was finished its mission. So people are sitting there saying, oh my goodness, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He's bound, locked, chained. Like, literally stop blaming Satan because Satan... Now, listen, is his kingdom still in existence? Sure, our mission is to go over there and now begin to plunder the goods. So there still is, a, is, 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 is this, this reign of darkness, but a big part of this reign of darkness is called Thanatos that's living in us. Amen. Or ouch, I mean, whichever. So, praise the Lord, let's take a look at it real quick. So in Matthew, it says, once again, uh, uh, one cannot rob Satan's kingdom without, without first binding Satan. See, Jesus' whole mission for the church is that we go plunder his kingdom. So what does Jesus do? He binds Satan, throws him down, locks him away so he can't go out and deceive the nations so that the church can go out and begin to proclaim the gospel and proclaim the truth, amen? And as we do, then we gather up those different nations. Once again, it started with 12 people where... We're now the largest religion on the entire planet. I mean, it's happening. It's working. It's on its mission. It's, it's, it's taking place. But God was very, very patient. And here's the deal. God doesn't care about a quick fix. He cares about a permanent one. See, we're into the quick stuff. We want microwave ovens, amen, cell phones that tell us everything and just click up a button. We're into the quick. God don't care about the quick. God wants the permanent. All right, so, so the way God has just chosen to go about this is so that by the time the end reaches its mission, there, he can throw death and hell and everything into the lake of fire, destroy it all because none of it will ever be needed again because his fix won't be a quick fix. It's going to be a permanent fix to the problem of men. And so you got to begin to ask yourself this then, what was the problem of men really? Well, we know Satan's no longer the God of this world. Satan's bound up in chains. Matter of fact, you know who the God of this world now is? Revelation tells us, amen, <laughs> come on. Revelation tells us, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, praise the Lord. By the way, uh, chapter 10 tells you that when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, that the mysteries of the Old Testament prophets have all found fulfillment. What did Jesus tell you when all those things find fulfillment? When he returns, the appearance in the clouds, the appearance in the sky. And so he says, when that happens, the, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign for a thousand years, no, forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. A thousand years is a representation of the church age. He's going to reign forever, everybody. Who has the world now? Is it Satan? For this purpose, I came to destroy the works of no, no, Jesus did what he came for. The reign is now God's. God is the God of this world. Jesus is the God of this world. And you say, then why is the world so dark if he's the God of it? Oh, it's a whole lot lighter than it used to be. <laughs> Amen. I know you don't think that because you're watching news too much. But there's never been a better time to be on planet Earth than, it, than the day you are currently living in. You go study history and actually, get, and actually start figuring out how some people had to live. Way better today than it's ever been before. Somebody said, well, don't have no kids now. Don't be having no children. It's going to get bad. <laughs> no, it's going to get brighter and more beautiful. And it's not going to get worse. It's going to get better. Because Jesus is going to fulfill the mission that he's on and he's using the church to do it. And it is happening. It's just slow. But just because it's slow doesn't mean it's not working. Because remember, God's not after a quick fix. He's after a permanent fix. And here's what, and here's what the king has to fix. Amen. He doesn't have to fix the world. Here's what he's got to fix. Jeremiah 17, the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. That's what he's got to fix. And so he bound up Satan so that he could fix the hearts of you and me. We didn't need Satan lying to us. Our, our, our heart, under Thanatos, under spiritual death, our heart was lying to us. Our heart is hopelessly dark and hopelessly deceitful. It is a puzzle that no one can figure out. You're never going to be able to figure out all the crazy stuff that's happening inside of you. 
That's why you need God in your life. That's why everybody else does too. Why, do, why is the world, when why do people do such bad things? Because Christ isn't in their heart and he hasn't begun. And, and they're not allowing him to go through the process of renewing their heart. But the more we surrender to the Lord and the more we allow him that work in our heart, and the more we get everyone else we know on board with that, and the better your family's going to be because the kingdom of God who cares about this world, we can start it right in our homes and the increase of his government and the increase of his peace is no end. And before you know it, you're getting the whole family together and nobody even fought this time. It's a miracle. Everybody loved each other all Christmas long because Jesus is reigning in my family. We can do it in this church. And the more they join this mission, the more it's going to happen through the world. He says, but I, God, even though your heart's got all this stuff that I've got to work out of them, I search the heart and I examine your mind. And I get into the hearts of humans. Come on, he wants to move right into your heart. I get to the root of things. And I will treat you as you really are, not as you're pretending to be. Wow. Come on. This is what God wants to do in each one of us. And the more that we each one, see, each one, just each one of us, I can't be responsible for the whole world, but I can be responsible for me. And if the church would stop poking its neighbor every time somebody says something, say, you need to hear that, you need to hear that. If we stop poking our, our neighbor and start just poking ourselves, Dude, I, I needed to hear that. Ooh, I needed to hear that. Yes, Holy Spirit, yeah. No, I'll make that change, God. The more people commit to that, the faster the process goes. But what I know is Jesus' rescue mission for this earth is not going to end in failure and defeat. Satan ain't going to gather up all the nations around himself again. He already did that. He can. He's locked and bound. So that you and I can go out and plunder his house. That means that we win, church. That means that you better get out there and start telling people about Jesus. We say, well I, well, I mean the world. They know it's going to listen. Yes, they are. The whole world will listen. There's a point that's coming that you're going to look for the ungodly and you won't be able to find them. There's a day that is coming that everyone, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We're on the winning side. We're not on the losing side. We need to act like we're winners, act like we're overcomers, act like we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus instead of sitting in the back and letting Satan have his way. You will win. More people want to hear what you got than what you know. And the problem is you don't even realize they are crying out for a God to save them from the depression and the suicidal thoughts and the junk and the darkness of their heart and they'll never be able to break free until you show them the way. We have the best news in the entire world. We can't keep keeping it to ourselves. Satan is defeated so we can plunder this world. Let's get about our Father's business. In Jesus' name, and the church said,